Fleeker's fault. It's entirely mine. Um, I did my best with what I had, didn't I? So here we go. Thank Curry you. Curry sent me the, the slides and I tried to put them together. So thank you very much. Would you like to take it away? Thank you. And thank you to everyone for allowing me to be on, which I think is an honour, uh, on an ASAP talk. And I hope my accent, you can understand it, as my mother tried so hard to send me to elocution lessons and failed miserably. So, um, I don't know how many of you know Bristol or Vieira. I live in South Bristol, in Hartcliffe. Uh, some people call it Lower Dundry. They don't want to be known <laughs> they come from Hartcliffe. But it is a wonderful part of Bristol. And I was lucky enough growing up to walk to, over to what we call Whitchurch Airport. It's now known as Hengrove Park. And over the years, when I started that interest in the paranormal, I then started hearing fantastic ghost stories of the area. So before I delve into that, I would just like to give a brief uh, overview of the history of what I think is one of the most famous uh, civilian airports out there. Someone's moving stuff around. <laughs> okay. And, you know, and unfortunately with the building of homes, etc. To me, it's very, very sad that a place with so much history is being lost forever. And unfortunately, I know the runway is protected, but the sports centre, which is one of the few buildings left from the original airport, is going to be bulldozed and turned into housing, which is such a shame. So, let's start. I have to look at my notes for some of the details. So, first of all, at the end, I will show you a book which I cannot recommend enough. It's by uh, Ken Wakefield and it's called Somewhere in the West Country. And he, like myself, was born and bred around this area and he fell in love with the airport, the same as I did. So, we go back to 1929. Around this area was just a few farms, farmland, and the dreaded Knoll Estate. As my dad said, growing up in Hengrove, a policeman would not walk on his own through those council streets. He was very notorious. So the Wessex Flying Club, Bristol Wessex Fly Flying Club, were at Filton. They wanted to relocate. So the Bristol Corporation bought 298 acres in 1929. And you can see a road going along on the left. That is the old Whitchurch Lane, which still exists, but a lot wider now. So by 1930, on the 31st of May, the Little Airport was opened up by the Duke of Kent. And over the course of the next few years, just to give you an idea of how popular it was, uh, it handled, or oh, the first year of operation, 915 passengers. And by 1939, it handled 4,000. The first building was a hangar, a clubhouse, as you can see in the middle for the flying club, if we'd like to go to number two, please, CJ. And you can see, take note of the two houses in the corner, because that will give you bearings for some of the later slides. Um, over the coming years became popular with planes flying further afield, such as Cardiff, Torquay, Plymouth, London, Liverpool, and then by 1935, France. But it was largely unknown airport, funny enough. By 1939, if we go to the next slide, please. Our lovely government knew that war was coming. So they decided to use that site and to start training pilots. Uh, so if you go to number five, please, CJ. 
I can see that. Yeah, I can see. Just move my picture over a little bit. Now, this was such a fantastic looking place. And, you know, some of the wealthy and famous people would come through, which I'll come to at the moment. Uh, the sad case, those that might not know, there's an airport, uh, a road we call Airport Road on the side. And in 1938, uh, a lovely inventor called Frank Barnwell died when his plane that he designed and built crashed, killing him just by um, the air, what was now the airport lights, which is a sad, sad thing. So next slide, please. Aha, some of the lovely training pilots. So World War II, and to me, this is the most fascinating part of the history of Whitchurch Airport. The government decided that it would allow, I think it's one of two municipal airports. And the interesting thing, there was a very famous flight out from Bristol. It would fly to Lisbon, uh, in Portugal, which was neutral, but spies from all the countries used to hop on and off. And I found it absolutely intriguing. It reminds you of the old Sherlock Holmes films, you know, when they used to get on the plane and the spy would look at each other because they knew who they were. Interestingly, though, you would hand in your um, ticket in the Grand Hotel, which is in the centre of Bristol in the old city. So from that time, you would then be put into a bus with blacked out windows and then ferried towards the airport. Passengers had to show their documentation. And the thing that I found fascinating was the government, the German and the English government, it seemed up to a point to have this unwritten rule that any plane flying from Whitchurch to Lisbon and back, no one would shoot it down. Unfortunately, that all changed on the 1st of June, 1943. Next slide, please. Ah, what a lovely, lovely man. Leslie Howard, famous film star, Gone with the Wind, many other fantastic British all black and white drama films. He boarded the plane with a total of 17 people, including crew. And unfortunately, a German plane shot them down, I believe, with the Bay of Biscay. No bodies were ever found. Uh, that to me was the saddest thing, you know. Um, and uh, the times I would walk over there and imagine, did these people walk in the same spot that I did? But there we go. Interestingly, the Grand Hotel. When I worked in a trophy shop in Bedminster for a few years, uh, an old chap came in as the Grand Hotel commissioned a big plaque. And I got talking because I'm very nosy and I love my history. And I asked them, you know, is it true there were secret meetings during the war? And he said, yeah, Churchill, Eisenhower, used to fly into Whitchurch Airport. They had a special room in the Grand Hotel where they would meet up and they would secretly fly out. Also, famous names. You had Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, and many, many more. Uh, the Queen of the Netherlands. They would all fly in and out of Whitchurch Airport. So, you know, it, it, it just makes it to me so, so interesting. Now, the next part, I cannot prove, so I'm going to say supposedly, but as my father was growing up uh, during the Second World War in Hengrove, it was literally 10 minutes walk from the airport, the local farmer was called Farmer Hazel. And him, my uncle, his brother, and many other children would terrorise the poor man. He didn't like kids on his fields. 
So he would do patrols with his big shotgun over his shoulders, my dad told me, scaring the children not to go on there. So we get the Americans into the war and my dad said, you do know, he said, when they built the big hangar, the Americans had so many casualties that they would fly them in secretly at night, put them in to the big hangar, fly them out the next day. So I'll go into that a bit more when I talk about the hauntings. So when I was allowed to investigate, I thought I'll ring up the US Army. So I rang America, went through different departments, asked if they could tell me this information and where I could find it, and they denied it ever happened. But one thing I've learned, and I can see Colin Simons is in there, locals of any location are so important because they have such vital information to share. And sometimes things you will never find in a textbook or on the internet. So, next thing. Lovely Grand Hotel, thank you. So after the war, just very quickly round it up, it closed, it had circuit racing, but it closed in 1959. And as a child, I used to go over to the airport and watch my dad fly his radio control planes. There we go, the lovely sight it is. And if he crashed the plane, he used to set fire to it after taking out the engine and the components, which to me was the highlight of a Sunday afternoon. So, brief history, and I know I missed out loads, but you could talk for hours about it. So, hauntings, what everyone wants to know. So, if we can go to the next slide, please, CJ. The runway. Now, this is what's left facing the Hengrove houses and out to the right of the picture is the sports centre as we know it now. So I was speaking with CJ oh, quite some time ago and I heard of a plane crash, a German plane that's supposed to have crashed at the airport during the Second World War but I can find nothing of it. So when I started my little team and we were very eager and I'm sorry, Kev Kerr, who tells me to be skeptic, I am skeptic now. We were on the runway with dowsing rods and all our little gadgets trying to talk to the airmen. Now we believed we did at the time, but who knows? But interestingly, there was a report in the 1980s of the opposite side, there were some mounds where the kids would go on their motorbikes and four people spotted a man with burnt clothing, witnessed by them all. And they watched him for a few minutes and he disappeared. So I will come to that in a second. So is the runway haunted? Right, next slide please, CJ. So when you look at Whitchurch Airport, many people don't realise it's a vast site. So we still have the Whitchurch Lane, which is obviously a wider road, and then the Bamfield Road. And the two houses are still there that you saw in the earlier photos. We'll see some more in a second. But behind here, you'll see Matthew Clark and the famous Sherry people and the Bottle Yard Studios. And then in about 2009, you had the cinema and a few shops and the Wessex Flyer Pub. Next one, please, CJ. So that is hot, the entrance to Harvey's and you can see on the back the offices in the middle of the photo. Now, I was chatting to a lady many years ago 
because my passion is history and I, I believe that if you're trying to investigate something, you need to try and find out as much as you can, not just of one site, but of the area. And the cleaners would report on the top floor of the offices, a sighting of a man sat at a desk very early in the morning. They would go to approach him and he wasn't there. I don't know how many times it happened. Unfortunately, I could never get in there to investigate, which is understandable. But you never know, there may be other sightings that we don't know of. Next slide, please. So, Cineworld. So again, still on the site of the airport. And I'll just find my piece of paper. So lucky enough, 2014, I had a God's daughter who was a manager there and they would tell me the stories of the man with the dirty face. So I persuaded her one Sunday night after it closed to let the, my team in South Bristol Paranormal to investigate. And when you go in, as I see, because there's multiple screens, and when you go up to the projection area, it's like an L shape. And the projectionists in those days, you had to do everything by hand. So they would be up there, and as it down the end of the long corridor, it would, it would bend to the left. A man would show his face around the corner, smiling broadly with blonde hair, cut short in the 1930s style, was slightly longer, it would flop over, you know, on the side of the face. And he had sort of like dirt on his face. And they would report this again and again. Now, I know we shouldn't jump to conclusions, but is this the German airman? Don't know. So we went in, we investigated. Uh, we went up to projection area. We didn't get anything, unfortunately, at the time. Though we did go, go down to two of the screen routes. And one of them, very interesting, we were three of us were sat down. We heard a seat go. So we stood up and as we went to it, we saw a seat had, had gone down. So we pulled it back up and then we tried to put it down, but it went back up. So we thought, OK, possibility was there someone sat there. And to me, it was such an interesting place. And uh, unfortunately, we wanted to go back and, and we couldn't later on. So the reports still continue as far as I'm aware, but that's all being knocked down to build houses soon, unfortunately. Progression. Next slide, please. Right, so let's get to hanger. Right. So remember the earlier photographs where you had a hanger, the clubhouse, the two cottages, they call them and another hanger. This is the service hanger. And I only just found recently the big hanger was called the BAC Engine Overhaul Building. The only thing I don't know is when it was built, I believe during the Second World War. So I used to go there for quite a few years before because in the smaller hangers, was a corridor and they were converted into changing rooms, men's, ladies, and don't laugh, a beauty parlor. So I would go there to have my beauty bits done as us women do. But one thing I noticed as I walked down the corridor to go to um, and see Polly, it used to creep me out. So again, being nosy, I'd go to reception and I would say, um, anything ever happened here? seems a bit you know bizarre so then they started telling me stories of what had happened next slide please this is the playroom this is next to still in the old 
cliffhanger, but of interest. And we'll come back to that in a second. So just so you can visualize what it looks like. Next slide, please. This is the main big hanger, as you can see. You know, it's not small. There are some rooms off on the side. There was an airsoft area. But to the right of this photo, down the bottom, was a long, thin room with shelves. And this is supposedly where the bodies that were flown in during the Second World War were stored, because it was a cold room, for the following day when it was flown out. Again, I cannot prove it, but none of the staff liked going in there to bring the kit out. The other reports from there is, you can see the nets pulled up. They will be down for five-a-side football. And a man in RAF uniform, if you go to the next slide, please. And I think we all know what an RAF uniform looks like from the Second World War, was seen frequently walking through. So we know, obviously, because the Second World War, we know there were many RAF personnel, pilots for the commercial fly, flies, uh, flights, that sort of thing. And he would never stop and talk. He was solid. They would see him on the CCTV cameras. They thought it was someone mucking about. They'll go and look. There'll be no one there. So again, you know, very, very interesting. So I approach the owners and I said, is there any chance that, you know, we could go in? And we were given strict instructions. Not a problem, but I don't want it out on for everyone to know. If it's just investigator, that's fine. So lucky enough, over the course of a year and a half, we were able to go there a few times. And unfortunately, I invited a team that I trusted. And they, in the play era, they did get on camera, sort of a shadowy figure moving. That was fantastic. But they went run into the local newspaper. And that then caused a massive bust up and unfortunately it stopped the rest of us investigating and it was such a fantastic sight. So some of the things that happens there. If next photo please CJ, you've been a darling. Oh no, we've gone past it, we missed one. Next one, is there another? With a boxing ring. We missed out the boxing ring. Well, if we, if we have, don't worry. Anyway, I'll carry on. It's not a problem. So down by one end, there were two boxing rings and there were those huge training punch bags. And we were there one night and one of the punch bags started swaying to and fro. So we walked down, drafts, etc. checked the others. They're all in one line, nothing which made it very, very interesting. Then Colin, who's watching intently, I can see him. He, and I'm sure he'll come on and, and tell me I said it wrong. We caught two EVPs. Now, Kev Kerr will say, I don't believe in EVPs. And we've all become very more skeptical over the years. What is an EVP? Is it really a voice of the dead? But interestingly, he got a name and we've actually found, I can't remember the name of the doctor, but we actually found this name did exist. Plus a name of a woman called Kim something, I believe, Colin, uh, that we could find no trace of her. One thing we kept away from were the modern deaths, obviously out of respect for, you know, for living relatives. We had as well, <laughs> In the changing rooms, voices, and we had some obviously some mediums come as well. And they spoke of a woman of the night being strangled. Who knows? Lots of things happen in surprising places. But it was again 
a very, very interesting place. And I think I'm coming to the end of it. But from, for me, the saddest thing is the closure of the what well, was left of one of the original 1932 33 buildings and the sad loss of this heritage site. The other thing of interest, so I forgot to mention, the Bottle Yard Studios. Myself and Colin were there three years ago filming a comedy. Well, it was a comedy, a game show called Cheap, Cheap, Cheap with Noel Edmonds. And that is haunted as well. Believe you me. Definitely haunted. So we did in, have fun winding up the crew and telling them about there's a ghost there. So that was great fun. But thank you so much. I hope I didn't muck it up too bad. I could go on for hours if there's other subjects, but to me, Whitchurch Sports Centre is fabulous and the airport in even in 1993, a plane landed on the airport because it ran out of fuel. And that was fantastic because everyone was running to see it. But there we go. Thank you. Put, I put the hat back on before I blind you. <laughs> okay, uh, I was showed, I was actually demonstrating before we started how much light reflects on my head. So thank you ever so much. That was fascinating, uh, fascinating and it's great to hear you see one of the problems we have is that back in the old days we used to have a fairly small number of groups and there was a limited number of places where they would publish and we'd all know each other so we'd all know what was going on but nowadays research like this takes place you do all this work and it doesn't get written up or published anywhere so it's brilliant to have you and i'd love to have you write an article for us for the magazine uh, I know Whitchurch slightly, so I'm going to start with a question or two in a moment. In fact, I don't know if Dave Sibby is here. Dave, can you unmute if you can hear me? I can hear you, Chris. Did you see your house? Um, no, but I saw a lot of a lot of stuff that was that was very familiar. I mean, I I can remember playing badminton down at the uh, Whitchurch Sports Centre. We used to go there to we used to hold yeah. a school sports day there. And I got terribly, terribly sunburned when you know one sports day while reading a book called The Day It Rained Mashed Potato. Okay. Any ghosts down there though, Dave? Had you heard any ghost stories from the site? Um, I hadn't. I, I really hadn't. Um so this is I mean this is all this is all fresh to me. Dave, your camera's pointing down. See if you can angle it up so we can see your eyes. And, ah, there we go. There we can get the full effect. So this is pretty much two or three streets from your house, isn't it? Which is why I was—I thought you'd be intrigued by this. So you, yeah. this is all new to you. So maybe you can chat with uh, the two of you can get together now and talk afterwards about the history of the area because Dave is a historian who's done a great oh, work yeah. on Bristol. And in fact, me and him actually have a ghost story from Whitchurch, don't we? Do you want to tell it, Dave? Yeah. It's a really yeah. pointless ghost story, mm -hmm. but I was there. So go on, tell the story. Um... It's a, it was, it was, um, just that, it was when we were both at college. Chris and a few friends came down to my house, you know, uh, you know, one evening, uh, one weekend, you know, was it October or Christmas? I can't remember. But that time of year, one winter. And if you know, you know, if you know Dundry Hill, there's, um, the remains of a Celtic hill fort and Maison Old Tump, which is a, yeah. a burial mound. And uh, I think, and after we came back from the pub, we decided, oh, we'll go up there right in the middle of the night in freezing cold in winter. What was the pub called? The Dagger or something like that? Shield and Dagger, Chris. Shield I worked dagger. there. <laughs> what? I worked there part time as a 25 year old, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this would have been a long time ago. So this is twenty odd years ago. So go on. So we went up. Uh, you know, we went up the. You know, we went up the East Dundee Road. Go up. Go into the field. And I hear a voice. Um. I hear a voice in my ear say, "Run." 
and I was there sort of, all hear that. And Chris says to me, don't run. And then we were all there sort of like, which one of us said it? No, no me, and Ben me. actually took off, didn't they? The other two actually started to run. But I, yeah, there was just this voice right behind us saying, run. And then yeah. we had this mad conversation as to whether or not we would, if it was actually a dweller from the barrow beneath our feet, if they would actually be speaking modern English. But I remember standing up there on Dundry Tump, looking out over the lights of Bristol below us. And just this, on this snowy day, and this, this voice was really loud in our ears telling us to run. So there you go. You have to go up there and have a look now, Karine. You really need to go up there. And... I I used to go up there a lot because my dad, you know, the, the steep side, he used to fly his gliders off the side of it. And um, we used to explore, you know, the old stone hut that was there. And my uncle used to go and camp up there when Bristol was being blitzed. Oh, Ooh. he was flying his gliders. They're lucky they didn't land on Dave's house, really, aren't they, Dave? <laughs> Yeah, at the bottom of the slope. Well, there, there, there are all, there are all, all manner of people who've got, have gone, have done strange things up on Dundry. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you know, you you used to see a lot of people flying the, flying the model airplanes, and also you see the um, people flying around in sort of like micro lights. Yeah. Question from Tony Hayes. Well, it's not a question. He says that he would be happy to help with the aircraft crashes, crew deaths. And oh that's... yes. Yeah, that's something that really does need. Yeah. I found the 1930s.